the Word of God, the primary focus that I have, of course, always to exalt Christ and make much, much of Him, but always to try to help each of us as Christians to find ways that we can uh, deal with different issues that come up in our lives and deal with them in a biblical, Bible way. And so often, uh, things that come in our life, we don't deal with it in a Bible way. We deal with it in a very natural way by default. But the natural way often isn't the right way. It often isn't the spiritual way. And uh, God gives us some wonderful guidelines of how we can deal uh, with this type of life. I've been told the message this morning, second mile Christianity. Second mile Christianity. We all have heard, I'm sure, the cliche or the little phrase, going the second mile. It's not just unique to this passage of Scripture, but this is where it originated from. Uh, but we often hear about going the second mile. Uh, it's a cliche, but what does it really mean? What's that phrase mean? you got to go the second mile. you got to go uh, the second mile. Well, the answer to the question, uh, we really need to pause and remind ourselves what was going on in the culture at this time to truly understand the depth and the significance. She's, well, I know what it, what it means. And then I'm sure on a, on a superficial level, we probably do know what it means, but there's a much broader, deeper uh, truth that we can glean from this if we understand the culture and the timing of why and how it was said of our Savior here. Uh, you remember this was a time uh, that uh, the Jewish people uh, were certainly under an occupied uh, uh, country at this time. Rome enforced its rule in the reign uh, in that area. And the Jews were with garrisons of soldiers stationed throughout the country uh, were always around. The soldiers were always around as they lived life. These soldiers were everywhere. They were in occupied territory. And uh, Roman law stated that, uh, that these occupying troops were permitted to force any Jewish citizen to carry uh, their backpack uh, or their stuff for a mile. That was required by law. That was something that was obligated. That was something that was expected. If you remember the story of Jesus where the, the man of Cyrene, they, they compelled him, the Roman soldier compelled him to carry the cross of Jesus. And that would have been the same type of thing that com compelled them. It doesn't matter what you were doing or where you were at. Uh, it was a law that was required of each of us. So as a soldier uh, would travel through the land of various duty assignments, they would carry all their belongings with them. They would have all of their uh, supplies. They'd all have all of their um, artillery, uh, you know, uh, uh, ammunition and guns and all that type of stuff, plus their own personal supplies. And uh, to ease the load uh, of, their, of their journey, uh, the provision of law would then allow any Jew to carry, well, it could be a Gentile too, but any individual by law was required to stop whatever they were doing at that moment, at that time, and they were then to take that backpack or take that gear of whatever they were, what was being carried, and they were required by law to carry uh, this uh, for one mile. And uh, you can imagine a Jewish man, just sort of picture it if you would, uh, he's doing his tasks, he's doing his errands, he's working his job, and a Roman soldier comes by, and they're everywhere and uh, in, the, in the occupied territory. And he comes by and says, hey, you, come over here, I need you. And then all of a sudden, by law, uh, you know, you're trying not to make eye contact. You don't want them to see you. you, don't, you know, you're busy doing your task. And, uh, but he calls you over, and by law, you're required to stop immediately what you're doing and uh, set that aside. And, uh, and then you are then to go take his backpack or take his supplies and whatever direction he was going, it may have been the opposite direction that you were going back home, uh, but whatever direction he was going, you were required by law to go at least one mile. And they would have, outs outside the town, they would have these mile markers, like we would have on the freeway, uh, but the mile markers were, were there to, yes, tell them how far they had to go, but also told the, the person carrying the load, all right, your, your, your guide stone, your mile markers right there, and you can put down the load at that time. And, and so this was a very um, difficult law. The Jewish people did not like the Romans at all. Uh, they were very oppressive, and they'd come in, and they had disrupted their, their culture and their way of living. And so this was not an easy task, just having them live amongst them as they were. But then to add this added burden uh, to where they would have to carry this backpack or this load uh, for at least one mile. And so the, the Jews hated. They hated the Romans. They hated this law, and, and they were forced to obey it. And so you can imagine the resentment and the bitterness that would have been in a Jewish man's heart uh, whenever that, that requirement was placed upon them as, as an individual. And so they, they would try their best at any cost 
to the Jews would to try to avoid these Roman soldiers because they knew by law at any moment they could be the one called to, to take up this mild journey with his soldiers. So they would they see him coming, boy, they would shut the doors, close the windows, get out of the way, and uh, want, wouldn't want to be found. On average, it would take about 20 minutes to walk a mile. 20 minutes to walk a mile. If you add a heavy burden, a heavy load in a backpack, and all the stuff, and the heat of the day, of the desert, uh, sun, it may take a 20-minute walk now, may take a, about a 45-minute walk. And uh, not only have you taken this journey uh, to the one mile, and then you put down that burden, you put down that backpack, but now you've got the mile walk back. And uh, so whatever, journey, whatever task you were doing, whatever job you were doing, whatever errand you were on, you had to stop, you had to drop what you were doing, and go back. And uh, to where you were and take off and try to get back in the right focal point uh, of where you were before. And so Jesus' statement here uh, was quite offensive uh, because he says that if you, if you are compelled by law or by a spear or by requirement to go a mile, he said, I want you to go twain. I want you to go two miles. And so you can understand the hatred already in their hearts of the listeners. Already the, the, the bitterness that was in their life as a result of what they had to do by law, what was required by law. And now Jesus, and they're listening to him preach the Sermon on the Mount, and now he comes along and he says, all right, uh, now you're required by law to go one mile, all right? And so that's great, wonderful, keep doing that. But he says, here's what I want you, I want you to go another mile. I want you to go a different mile. I want you to go an additional mile in addition to that one mile. Uh, you see, second mile things are, are, are the above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, you do what's expected on the first mile. You do what's required on the first mile. Uh, you do what's uh, uh, by law of the first mile. But that second mile is what you do over and above uh, what's expected. It's over and above what uh, is required by the law. Second mile, Christianity is going beyond what's required and was expected. What others ask for favors, be more accommodating than what they expect. And so Jesus calls his followers to not simply just meet the expectation of what you want, but to exceed the expectation. Don't just do what you have to, and then as soon as you come to the mile marker, you drop it. It's all right, I did my, I did my dues, paid my dues. I did my task. I did my job. I fulfilled my obligation. I fulfilled the law of God, and you drop it right there at the, the mile marker. God says, I want you, when, you, when someone compels you to go one mile, he said, I want you as a follower of mine, he said, I want you to go an additional mile. I want you to go two miles instead of one mile. And so uh, you can see then uh, the, the offense that this would have brought. Already the one mile was hard enough by law. And now he wants them to go an additional mile. And again, they didn't love the Romans. They hated the Romans. They despised them. And there was a bitterness in their heart towards them. And so Jesus calls us as his followers, or them as his followers, to not simply meet the expectation, but to exceed it. Now how about, uh, how about uh, do we go about the second mile? Well, financially, uh, he may call us to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to do something in our generosity. He may call us emotionally, call us uh, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Uh, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, professionally, he may call us to, uh, to a standard of excellence at our job uh, for the glory of God that far exceeds whatever is on the work criteria when you sign up for the job. So I didn't sign up for this, and this wasn't on my uh, uh, resume, and this wasn't what you know was on my job expectation. I wasn't on there. But a child of God goes that extra mile. Doesn't do just what's required, just what has to be done but goes that additional mile. And so let's first look, as we look at this second mile Christian, we can't really look at the second mile Christian until we first look at the first mile Christian. And it's sad to say, uh, many Christians aren't even going the first mile. And uh, we'd be uh, fortunate to get a lot of Christians to go a quarter of a mile, uh, much less a mile. But God says you've got to start off, by law it's required, by law it's an obligation, it's expected of you, and, and that expectation is to go one mile. So the first mile was a mandated law. It was a, it was a law motivated by the law. Uh, there was no other motivation other than the law requires it. It's what's expected. i got to do this task. It's a duty, and you stop what you're doing, you go the mile. The first mile always is the hardest. Ask any distant runner, and you start off sort of like a, a long trip, and you get up early in the morning, you know, and you're going to leave early. You guys left early and uh, went on your trip in uh, Oklahoma, right? And, and so I uh, got up early, and that first hour of driving, I mean, you're like trying to keep your eyes open. It's like, what in the world? And and uh, that first mile you're trying to run on a marathon, marathon run is the hardest. And uh, once you get past the first mile or so, once you get going, then all of a sudden things begin to kick in. So, kick in. so the hardest mile 
is going to be that first mile. It's doing what's obligated, doing what my law, doing what's required, doing what's expected. Uh, but it's not without the first mile, there's no possibility of ever accomplishing the second mile. And so before we can get to the second mile of doing God says, I want you to exceed what's expected. You got to first do what's expected. You got to do that first mile uh, in your life. And, and so we see then the first mile is vitally and very important to be done. The first mile is required. The Jews were obligated to walk uh, this first mile. And let me just say this they received no special honor. There was no special awards. There was no certificates presented to them. There was no accolades that was given. Hey, congratulations, you did the first mile. Uh, it was something required. It was something expected. And there was no fanfare. There was no appreciation. There was no thank you on what was expected. I wonder how many of us in our lives that uh, we do what we do and we get offended because someone doesn't uh, pat us on the back and doesn't give us a credit that we think we deserve and, and doesn't thank us like we think we were deserving. So don't give us the accolades unless we stop doing the things that God wants to do the first mile because we don't get the attention. Listen, the first mile is a mile without recognition. It's just you do it because it's a right thing to do. It's a thing you do because it's, it's a proper thing to do. And it's a right thing. It's what's expected. Uh, it's a, a husband being faithful to his wife. That's expected. It's a wife being faithful to her husband. It's expected. It's not saying, well, you got to be appreciative and thankful and give accolades every day. Well, thank you for your faithfulness today, honey. Thank you for your faithfulness today, honey. And over and over and over again, it's something that's expected. It's required. It's something that just is something that you do. The extra mile, though, that second mile is beyond the call of duty and so no one would notice anyone that had done just the first mile no one would be no fanfare at the first mile because you're doing what you have to do and when you do what you have to do your obligation you have to do what's right before you get to the second mile uh, you got to do what you do without all the applause to get to the second mile you have to do what's right because it's the right thing to do and you get no appreciation you get no uh, uh, gratitude you get no pat on the back you get no motivation to keep going well, you're supposed to do those things you're supposed to do right and so that obligation that law that's given and so we see though that the second mile uh, is not a mile of obligation it's a mile of opportunity and so we go from obligation of I have to do it to now opportunity, I get to do it. And so that's where we want to come in our Christian life. Uh, some of us here today, uh, we're in church because we have to. And uh, my wife made me come to church today, right? And uh, your wife made you come to church today. And so you're here today because you have to be here. And, uh, and so hopefully though, and that's all right, there, that's a stage that we're going to grow through in our lives. But if we've been saved for an extended period of time and you're still doing right because you have to do it, then, uh, then we got to grow through that. And so then there's others of us that we're not in church because we have to be here. We're in church because we want to be here. And that uh, we look for opportunities to say, no, I, I can't, I got to rearrange my schedule here. I, gotta, I can't do that here. Why? Well, I got to be in church. It's church time. I got to go to church. And so we work around our schedule to be able to accomplish those different things. Uh, Brother Justin's been working good, bringing a lot of, uh, uh, of his uh, co workers and uh, things into church from law enforcement things. And, and, uh, but he's been also during the summer months going camping and things. And he says, Pastor Boy, I, I got to be in church on Sundays. I'm going camping this way I'm going camping this way I gotta be in church on Sunday I gotta be in church on Sunday and uh, and what's he doing he's realizing listen it's not something I have to do I want to do it I want to be here I want to be in the, the, the house of God with the people of God hearing the word of God proclaimed so the first mile is what we do out of obligation uh, I have to the second mile says this is something I want to now do you want your husband ladies to love you because he has to or because he wants to huh Heather, all right, how about all that? And or Hannah, and uh, how about all those different things there? Uh, do you want that or do you want the, the have? Gina, do you want him to have to love you or you want him to want to love you? Or he does, he wants to love you. And he's shown his faithfulness over the years. And so same thing with God. As we look in our lives, uh, we see God looking at us and God, I want to love you because I have to. No, I want to love you because I want you. I want to serve God because I want you. I want to live for God because I want you. I want to follow God because I want you. Not because I have to. And, and again, we're going to grow through those stages, but uh, that's where we want to be in each of our lives. And so we want to grow to the second mile of Christianity. Now, as we look at this first mile of Christianity, and, and uh, first mile things have to be done, uh, first mile things are, are not, in the, spot, uh, are not uh, in the spotlight, but they're, they're vital things, they're necessary things, they're foundational things. And so uh, that's why it's so important to do what you do uh, out of anonymity, where you just say, you know, it doesn't matter who did it. Don't, it doesn't have to put a title or position. I don't have to be known 
known by having done it. I'm just glad to serve the Lord. I'm glad to sere the Savior. And uh, my name doesn't have to be in the limelight. Why? I'm a person. I'm just doing what's supposed. That's what we're supposed to do as a Christian. That's what we're supposed to do as a servant of God. That's what we're supposed to do as a member of Life's Path Church. That's what we're supposed to do. It's the right thing to do. And so we're willing to serve uh, even when no one else notices. And uh, we thank God for the many, many serving uh, behind the scenes. You don't know them. They're serving. The, whether it's in the nursery or whether it's in the, around the landscape or the yard or the, the cleanup or the things behind the scenes or the lunch that we'll enjoy today that, that, that prepared those and even now preparing the meal and barbecuing the burger and getting the meals prepared for all the behind the scenes stuff that they're being done are so important. Uh, but the second mile, uh, Christian is what God desires in all of us. But we got to start with that first mile. So there's the kind of Christian that are willing to serve without the fame, without the recognition, without the notoriety. It's serving for the audience of just one. You're just serving for God. And the Bible says he beholds the good and the evil. We often focus on God sees the bad that you do, but God sees all the good that you do too. God sees the kind uh, response in that text of someone. God sees a little uh, generous uh, cookies you prepared for the pa pastor, generous cookies you prepared for the pastor, and just a little throwing some things out there, and uh, just little things that you do behind the scenes that nobody knows about. And, and so you throw those things out there, and, and God uh, sees everything. And so you can't skip mile one uh, to get to mile two. And uh, because mile two is about uh, the spotlight. It's about uh, looking at what you're choosing to do. It's about what you're doing. Uh, number one is not in the spotlight. Number two, though, uh, is certainly uh, the mile two is going to look more about the important things. So don't skip the first mile because you want the recognition of the second mile. Uh, boy, look at We thank God for so much. They just volunteered their time. They did so much and did so much effort. And we're thinking, well, what about me? I did a lot of stuff, too. And, uh, but it wasn't that second mile, it wasn't that extra that was gone uh, over and above. So don't, don't lean uh, more towards the glamour of the second mile and tend to skip the first mile kind of stuff. And uh, he wants us to walk the second mile. He tells us to walk the second mile, but he says you better walk the first mile. You better walk the first mile. Do what's expected, all right? Do what's required. Uh, do what's an obligation. Do what's a duty. And uh, do those things. And the more you do what you're supposed to do, then you do it because you have to. It's going to transition now. You become a second mile Christian. Uh, that you do it because you want to. You'll never do what you want. To. You'll never do right because you want to until you do right because you have to. And you'll never do right unless you do it because you have to do it. Listen, a child ha has to what? Eat their vegetables. I don't like green beans. I don't like peas. I don't like the broccoli. I don't like this. It doesn't matter what you like. This is what you're going to eat. This is what you have to eat. All right? And so you eat the right food because you have to do it. And then you begin to create. Now, I never got to create an appetite for peas and all those things afterwards. But you know the story, the illustration that goes along there. And so we've got to start with, I have to do it. All right, that's okay. But then now, I, now some of us, you're doing what you want to do, but used to not want to do it. You, you had to do it. I had to go to church. But now I want to go to church. I had to read my Bible. But I want to read my Bible. I had to pray. But now I want to pray. I had to invite people, my friends, to church. And now I, I look forward to inviting my friends to church. So you're growing. That's wonderful. Now the second mile, Christian, is important. Why go beyond obligation? Why go beyond duty? Why, why, why go beyond what, what's just one mile, what's expected? Well, I think the short answer is this. We do it for Jesus. We do it for him. For the audience of one. And uh, realizing that he's watching, he knows, and uh, he's going to reward us accordingly. He's going to give us the accolades. He's going to give us the, the things that uh, will continue to motivate us to do the right thing. And so we see then the second mile, uh, the obligation things of the first mile, but we want the second mile uh, for our Savior. You do what you do that's right because it's the right thing to do. But you go the ex you exceed, you go beyond, you go, you go the extra mile because you're saying, I want to do this for my Savior. And uh, hey, he went the extra mile for us, amen. And I'm glad that when things got tough, he didn't stop going. He kept on going. He took his cross, and there on the cross, he died. But as the Bible says, but God commanded his Lord to love towards us, and while we had sinners, Christ died for us. He paid my sin debt. I owe a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt I could not pay, and he paid it for me. And my trust in Christ allows me to go to heaven. He went the second mile. Praise God, he came the first mile. He did what was expected and required, but he went beyond. He did the second mile. And I'm thankful for that second mile. Because of him leading my example to the second mile, then I also, and we also, must go that second mile for the sake of our Savior. Uh, now we see then the second mile is what we call the miracle mile. 
the miracle mile. It's a mile not motivated by the law, what's required. It's a, it's a motivated by the love that we have for God. And so why do you do what you do? Because I love God. You see, there's going to be a lot of reasons that you and I can use of why we can stop doing what's right, and, uh, but there'll never come a reason that you can say that I'm going to not do it because I don't love God. I love God. And so that's what gets you up in the morning to get and do right again another day. That's what gets you up to read your Bible another day. Why? I love God. I want to firmer my love for God and strengthen my love for God and grow that love for God. And so I do what I do. Why do you do what you do? Because I love God. And it doesn't start off that way. Listen, every one of us got saved not because we love God. We didn't get saved and know we're going to heaven because we love God. We got saved because we didn't want to go to hell. I didn't get saved because I wanted to go to heaven. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. And the alternative of not going to hell was going to heaven. And as I learned how much God, for God so loved the world, they gave us only the son, who so believes in him shall perish. That have everlasting life. God loves me and made it possible for me to go to heaven. But I didn't, go, I didn't get saved because God loves me. And God, you love me so much, I want to trust you as my Savior. No, I don't want to go to hell. I want to trust you as my Savior. And then now over these years of being a Christian, I've learned how much God loves me. It's an inexhaustible, uncomprehendable of how much God loves us. And as I'm growing in my understanding of how much God loves me, the love of Christ constraineth us. It then motivates and challenges us to a greater level of what? Traveling that journey of an extra mile because I know how much God loves me. He's gone the extra mile for me. And he should have, he, if I was God, I would have given up me a long time ago. Amen. And if I was God, I wouldn't have given me another chance, another chance, another chance. But God's given me multiple chances in my life. Like he has in you and God has gone the second mile in your life. And you ought to God to say, God, you've gone the second mile multiple times for me. The least I can give to you is another mile. And uh, for your sake and uh, for your glory and for your honor. And so, if you, so we look then at the, the motivated by love. And so Jesus calls on us uh, to do not just re what's required, the first mile, yes, we're to do that, but God also says, I want you to be motivated by love for Christ and uh, will extinguish you as a believer in the eyes of others where you go that extra mile. Let me just say this, uh, the extra mile is what enhances your testimony and uh, gives credibility to your witness. The extra mile is what enhances your witness and gives credibility to your, uh, or your testimony and then gives credibility to your witness. Uh, if you want to see your fellow employees saved, if you want to see your boss saved, your supervisor saved, you want to see those that you work alongside of saved, uh, then you've got to show them that you're an extra mile employee. And uh, why? Because that soldier wasn't influenced by that Jew the first mile. I mean, they understood the hatred they had for each other. And uh, there was an animosity that was built in. There was a bitterness, resentment they had for each other. But when all of a sudden, that Jew, when, he, when the soldier expected him at that mile marker that was very strategically placed on those Roman roads, and uh, he kept walking. And he thought, hey, I'm getting a few extra steps out of this guy. I'm going to keep going. The soldier would think, I'm getting a few extra This is pretty good. But then pretty soon... He saw the guy didn't just miss the marker and just sort of, you know, missed it. This was something that was being done on purpose. All of a sudden, that extra mile backpack carrying time began to make an impact on that soldier. And I'm sure out of curiosity, he said, hey, why, why are you carrying this pack the extra mile? You, you know we don't have much likings for each other. You know we don't put up with each other much very good. And Why are you doing this? Hey, hey, why, why are you taking this another mile? You only have to go one mile. It's back there. You could have dropped off my gear back there. Why are you going a little bit further? What a great opportunity for them to open up the plan of salvation. And so let me tell you why I'm going the extra mile. Because several years ago, there was a man by the name of Jesus that came into my life. And he began to share with him the story of salvation about how that he should have not be alive today. He should not be walking where he's walking today, but by God's grace and God's mercy, he's able to have a purpose and a vision, a cause with which to live his life. And now he's able to say, here's why I'm walking this extra mile for you, is because Jesus walked an extra mile for me. Let me tell you, God loves you. God loves you. And that extra mile began to what? It enhanced his testimony, what others think of your Christ by looking at you. 
What others think of Christ by interacting with you. That's what your testimony is. How others view and, and, and determine how Christ is. What, what, what he is. What kind of Jesus is he? By looking at your life and they see you go that extra mile. You don't have to do that. You're not required of that. You're not getting paid for that. What in the world? Why are you doing that? And boy, that opens up an opportunity. Now you have a more effective witness to be able to share them. This is why I do it. Because you see, you're not my boss. God's my boss. And, and I'm not working for you. I'm working for my boss, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I want to do what I do in an excellent way. I'm going to exceed what you require of me. I want to far exceed that to his expectation. You know, we have dumbed down America so much that, uh, that if we just get a basic education, we think we've arrived. Listen, we, we've got to exceed what's expected of us. You go into a job and say, well, I, here's what's required of you. Oh, right, I can do that. Well, you exceeded that thing. There's room for promotion. There's room for advancement. There's room for it. Because most don't exceed. They do whatever. When the clock rings, they're done. They're out. They're gone. And, and they leave everything behind. And so God says, I want you to use your extra mile to enhance your testimony, how others see Christ in you. And it's also to give credibility or witness to share the story of salvation. So the extra mile, uh, if you want to win your coworker, if you want to win your boss, you'll never do it if you're just a first mile employee. Unbelievers are not impressed by first mile Christians, but they respect a believer whose faith is sincere and who lives a second mile Christian life. Anyone can do a first mile. In fact, you're supposed to. A believer and unbeliever. You're supposed to follow the law. You're supposed to do those expectations. That's what's expected for you on the job. This is what you're getting paid for. But when you go the extra mile, they see something in you as a worker, as a student, as an individual, as a Christian. They see, and all of a sudden, you get their attention. And so now you've given them an opportunity to ask you some questions. Why, why do you do this? I mean, why do you go so much overboard to make this thing do? You're not getting paid extra for this. You're not getting uh, any extra brownie points. Well, why are you doing this? And now let's use that as an opportunity to say, well, I do it as in the Lord. Because I'm a Christian. As a Christian, I, I'm to excel at whatever I do. I, I know I'm not as good as I, could, I should be, and others of the, of the employees that are here are much more talented and skilled than I am. But I give the best effort I can. I give the best time that I can. I give the, you know, and so you're focusing on that, and you're getting the focus of the conversation back on God. Now, how are we to walk this second mile? How are we to walk this second mile? And that's an important question, because the only way to walk for Jesus is to walk with him. See, I cannot, and it's so important we understand, I cannot walk that second mile in my own strength. I can't. It's so unnatural for me because I want to do just, I mean, I don't like the first mile. I don't like hearing the backpack the first mile. I mean, I, I hate this, the, this Rome, Roman soldier. I hate the, the inconvenience he brings in my life and the, the discomfort. I don't like it. And then God now says, I got to go. I'm offended by the thought. Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount. You got to go two. Go twain. Go two miles instead of one mile. Now, how, how are we supposed to do that? Well, I can't do it. The only way to take the second mile is with the empowering help of God. You see, there's a lot of things in your life you can do the first mile. God, uh, by law, will ask you to do some things. He said, I can do that. I can willpower myself to do that. I can decide by character to do that. I can determine to do that. I, I can make myself do that. But then there's some things that in the Christian life, as you begin to progress, you find out, I can't do that. That's beyond my pay grade. That, that's beyond my spiritual. You, know, you may be able to do that, but I can't do that. And, and so we come to this place in our life that says what? You're going to need my power, God says. You're going to need my strength. You're going to need my empowerment to be able to accomplish this second mile. For example, uh, it is enjoyable to do the second mile stuff for people if they respond positively. We love to go the second mile and then be rewarded. Wow, you have like really gone overboard in this. I mean, I would just ask you to, to get a little uh, event together, but you, I mean, you really made it special. You, you really, you gave it all the bells and went, I mean, you really made, and so, you, I mean, people are thanking you and praising you and bragging on you. Wow, you really, really put a lot of effort in it. Thank you for it. You made it so special for us. And so it's much easier to go the second mile when the whole time you're taking that journey, the soldier's saying, wow, you're like awesome. You're like amazing. 
And uh, this, is, this is unbelievable. And I, I've never met someone as, you know, and all of a sudden you're getting all these praise and, and, and recognition, and so that's certainly a motivation to go on. But was this necessarily the, uh, the, the direction God was giving them? Because it's easy to get forward and go forward, and, and when we're rewarded because of that, and we're, we're appreciated because of our un, unusual acts of kindness. But look with me, if you would, go back to Matthew chapter 5 and look in verse number 39, just a couple of verses prior to this statement of Jesus, where he talks about the second mile. Look what he says in verse chapter 5 and verse uh, number 39. But I say unto you, be you resist not evil. Don't retaliate, don't fight back evil. Now evil by definition is hurt that's done with, uh, things that are done with the intent to hurt you. There's people at your job, oh, they want to hurt you. They don't want you to get the promotion, they want the promotion. They're going to lie about you, they're going to undermine you, they're going to, you know, all kinds of stuff. They're evil. Why? They want to hurt you. They want to hurt your credibility. They want to hurt how you look in the eyes of the boss. They just want to hurt you. And so he says, when re evil comes, says don't resist it. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, verse 38, turn to him the other also. Now let's, let me make sure we understand the issue that Jesus is saying here. Suppose it's a right-handed man, and most folks were right-handed. And so unless you were really, you know, awkward in how you would hit someone on the right cheek and, and with the right hand, you were, you were basically uh, uh, back, back-slapping him uh, with the right hand on the right cheek. And uh, you would be backslapping him. He's standing, look at you. And so you're not punching him necessarily. You're backslapping. And so uh, that type of contact or, or interaction, according to Jewish law, that was a very, very demeaning, very disrespectful. I mean, that was a very, uh, um, uh, you know, attacking your credibility in regards to uh, the individual that, that you were. And it was a very, very, uh, um, uh, versus the, you know, flat hand uh, slap. And so it was very uh, insulting to an individual. So when Jesus told us to walk the second mile, he wasn't talking about responding uh, to people that, that like you because you go the second mile. He was talking about people that don't like you and you still go the second mile. I'm talking about people that insult you uh, with that slap, the back slap, and you go the second. Listen, it's easy to go the second mile for those uh, that have gone the second mile for you. It's easy to go the second mile for those that brag on you and clap at you and say, good job, and I'm so proud of you. Keep up the good work. But how about that one that insults you? How about that one that irritates you? How about that one that, that aggravates you? How about that one that, you, that there's a hatred, there's, a, there's animosity they have towards you, and, and you're trying to move forward for God? And God says, that's the extra mile I want you to go to without the positive reinforcement. In fact, when you go the extra mile, they give you negative reinforcement. They, they try to undermine the extra mile uh, that you're trying to do as a result of that. And so we see that uh, later in the same section of Scripture, look down at verse number 44, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. And so here's some things God wants us to do in these, this Sermon on the Mount. And these are things that I cannot do in my own strength. And so the second mile requires me to tap into God. And that's why I've got to do what I have to do the first mile. And when I do what I'm supposed to do, then God sees my desire to do what's right, even though it's hard to do. I don't want to do it, but I do it because that's the right thing to do. I have to do it, so I do it anyway. And then God then does what? He then allows me with his strength to be able to do what I need to continue to do with those that are insulting, those that, that, are, that are hurtful, those that are unjust, those that are mean, those that take, talk about me negatively, those, and God says, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to pray for them. I want you to do good to them. I want you to be nice to them. This is the group of people God's talking about going the second mile with. Not the guy that, that, that pats you on the back and claps and, and does to you the same thing you're doing to them the second mile. But this is the crowd that God's talking about. He wants to go the second mile. And so we see then the text, Jesus is proclaiming the absolute requirement of God's presence and power if we're going to have the extra mile Christian. Remember, Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. So we learn then by the indwelling presence of God with us, as we tap into God's strength, we can do what God asks us to do on the second mile. I can't do it. I know you can. But with God, you can. With God, you can. And so can't is not a part of God's vocabulary. It won't 
is a part of our vocabulary, but God says, I want you to do this, but it's hard, God. And God, I've already done the, the requirement. I've already done what's obligated. I've done what I'm supposed to do, and God said, I want you to go the extra mile. Why? That enhances your testimony. That gives credibility to your witness. That allows the world that's trying to hurt you and be evil to you to see there's something different about your life that's different than all other people they come in contact with. Because most people, when they hurt, they hurt back in return. Most people, when they're unkind, are unkind in return. Most people, when they're unjust, are unjust. So it's a reciprocation. But God says, when that happens to you, backslash you, insults you, that's the person I want you to go the extra mile with. I wonder who it is in our lives today that, uh, that God's requiring you to take the second mile with that one at work, in your family, someone you know that's, that's hurtful, that's unkind, that's unjust, that, that's not, you know, it's, it, that lies about you and all kinds of hearts with you, all those things. And God said, I want you to go that extra mile. On the first mile, you can stand on your own. You see what you can accomplish, but nothing more. On the second mile, it's much different. You're no longer alone, but you can stand with Christ. And you can do it. With his power, you can do it. With his strength, you can be a, a kind person. You can love your enemies. You can pray for those. You can uh, uh, be kind to those. That despite, you can do it. You demonstrate that you're more than a good person. You're now a child of God. Hey, anyone can do what's required under the law. Listen, an unbeliever, a believer, but that second mile can't be done without the power of God. That second mile can't be done without you tying upon God and saying, God, I can't do this. I can't go on without your strength, without your power. And God's grace is efficient and God's power is available and God's power will help us to go the extra mile cheerfully. Why? Because it's not me doing it. It's me submitting and yielding to God so that God through me can accomplish that task, and uh, we can reach the destination that God uh, would have for us to go. And so the demand that God places upon a Christian uh, to travel that extra mile, there's a million mile difference between the first mile Christian and the second mile Christian. That's what separates those that go on and do some great things for God that God can use in a great way, and those that just do what's expected. They do what's required. They do what they have to do. I did my, my duty. I'm glad you did your duty. That's the right thing to do. God says you gotta, you got to go the first mile. Do what's right. Do what's right. Do your duty. But if you're going to have an influence on that world that you're in, interacting with, your family, your coworkers, your classmates, your, your, your fellow soldiers, your, you know, whoever we're interacting, whoever that sphere of influence is, and we're going to make a difference, we've got to go and be willing to go with God's strength, not our own strength, We've got to go that second mile. So the best worker at your job ought to be you as a Christian. The one that complains the least at your job should be you as a Christian. The one that has the best attitude in your school or your platoon or your whatever is what? A Christian. You ought to be one because you're going the second mile. Does it mean it's not hard? No, it's sure it's hard. But God's given you the strength. God's given the willpower. God's given the wherewithal to do it. And so therefore you can do it in God's strength. You can accomplish. You can be what? More than conquerors. You're not just conquering the first mile. You're a more than conqueror. You're going the second mile, the third mile, the fourth mile. You never thought you'd go that far. But you didn't go in your strength. You went in his strength. You look back and say, wow, I have gone a long ways with God's help and God's power. Praise God. Look what God's done. And guess who gets the glory? Guess who's magnified? It's not us. It's God that got us here. And it's God that brought us this far down the road. And so the first mile, uh, we stand on our own. The folks on us, look what, look what I've done. And the second mile is the folks on him. Look what he's done uh, through us. Our power, our compassion, our patience is not sufficient to go to the second mile. You can't love people who hate you, who make their desire to hurt you, unless you have the power source of Jesus Christ, uh, despised and rejected, acquainted with grief. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Listen, for Jesus went the extra mile of the cross, and there he carried that cross of Golgotha's heel, and there uh, crucified for our sins, and paid our sin debt, and died in our place, and suffered our hell. He went the second mile, and he comes to you and I and says, listen, I want you because your love for me, because your desire to please me, to not just be a first mile Christian, do what's expected, but go the extra mile and do that which is unexpected. Wow, I didn't expect you. I, I didn't, that's beyond what I had even anticipated. 
I didn't, I didn't expect that of you. And uh, that's all right. I wanted to do that for you. And uh, well, that was on my job, job criteria. I know, but that's, that, I wanted to do this. And all of a sudden, what you've done, now you've entered in an arena to where now you can what? Enhance your testimony. And now you give credibility to your witness. And they'll ask. They'll say, well, why, why do you always get to work? You, you don't get paid until, you know, 7 o'clock. Why do you get here at 630 your, your shift doesn't start till 7. Why do you get here at 6.30? I like, and then you can begin to tell them, well, I like to get here, so I'm, by 7 o'clock, I'm not, you know, I, I'm ready to go. And that's not, I got to get to 7, get my coffee, and then by 7.30, 7.45, I'm ready to transition and start working. I, I got about 30-minute transition time. By the time it's 7 o'clock, I'm hitting and running. I'm going. And, uh, and so, and then you can use that as a testimony and say, you know, I'm a Christian. As a Christian, I believe that we ought to, that we ought to give a good day. If we're getting paid for an eight-hour day, we need to give it a good, good eight-hour work. And we need to do the right thing. And, and so what are you doing? You're giving the glory to God. You're magnifying God in what you do. And so often, we, we screech in at the last moment. We screech out the, at, the, at the last moment. We're in and out quickly. I did my duty. Yeah, but you missed your opportunity to enhance your testimony and for others to, to be curious of why why you do what you do? Why are you? Why are you so? Well, yeah, you got We got some guy working in the bank and thing. Well, you always, well, you got to get right down the nitty gritty. Got to get right down the penny and balance. You know, dollar two, close enough. Oh no, I got to get right. My mom, boy, she was a stickler on that. Boy, she had to get. And she'd stay up nights and she'd be calling me up. She's, I, I figured it out well, where that three cents is, and uh, she'd call and say, I figured it out, and uh, she'd have Mom, it's fine. Good. Put the three cents in yourself. You're good to go. No, I got to find this. I got to find out. And she'd find out some little typo or something that she did, and she'd get it figured out. Why? Because she was. Working Working for the audience of one. And she'd stay up at night and figure that thing over and over again. Why? She wanted to exceed, excel at what she's doing. So whatever you do, don't just do what's expected. Excel. Excel. Do beyond. So you go, use a restroom, for example. You use a restroom and you go in there, you wash your hands. And, uh, and, and you clean up after yourself with a paper towel. You clean the sink that you use and clean with the soap, maybe drip down or whatever else. Clean up your sink. That's expected of, of you, all right? But go the extra mile. Take an extra paper towel and clean the sink next to the, to the sink you use or the couple of sinks next to it. And so you just sort of clean up around you. You went the extra mile. And uh, that wasn't expected. You just, you just did it. And uh, why? Because uh, that's just, you just want to, you want others to know that you're not this, like everybody else. You're different. You're different. And there's something different about you that creates a curiosity. And that curiosity creates questions. The Bible says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the hope that's in you, the reason that's in you. He says, and so create opportunities, questions that they can ask you. And that's a great way to ask. And so you're a hard worker, you're diligent, you're honest on the job. Everybody's cutting corners, doing this and that, and you're honest. You know, I said, no, no, we, we can't do that. We got one of our guys in the work, he's got to do inventory and a lot of different things, and, and he's got some, some you know, undercurrents and things because he's trying to do things right, and he's trying to do this, and they're trying to put pressure on here and there. Well, you know, this is just what we do around here, and this is how we do it. And uh, he said, well, that may be how you used to do it, but, but I've been put in charge to do it this way, and this way is supposed to be done, and this is the right way to do it. And, uh, and so he's doing it the right way. He's getting some opposition, some pressure coming in because they're not used to the right way. But he says, you know what? I'm serving God. And every tool that's checked out, and every item that, that is itemized here, it has to be accounted for. You know why? Because I'm not just doing what's expected. I'm doing beyond what's expected. And that's what's going to give each of us a great testimony. And so wherever you are in your life, whatever you are, uh, go the extra mile. As, as a mom, as a dad, uh, your, your parents, your in-laws are going to say, man, you, you guys put so much time with your kids, and you guys put them through the Christian school, and you're doing this and that and everything else. And Well, that's a big expense. And then why are you doing all that? What, what's going on? And you're able to say, we're going the extra mile. We're going the extra mile. And that extra mile is the testimony of your love for God. God says, okay, one mile. Now, are you going the one mile? Are you even a one-mile Christian? Are you doing what you're supposed to do because you have to do it? I don't want to, but I have to do it. Okay, are you a one-mile Christian? You'll never be a two-mile Christian if you're not a one-mile Christian. And so if you do what you do because you, you don't want to do it, there's going to be a lot of things I don't do. There's a lot of things I don't want to do, but I have to do it. But then as I do what I'm supposed to do over time, it then becomes no longer a have to, but now it's 
I want to. I want to. Why? Because I, I love him. He loves me. But he said, I want you to do it because you love me. Because you love me. Sometimes, oftentimes, the husband will ask my wife, honey, why did you do that? And, and why you didn't have to do that? Why did you do that? And she said, honey, because I love you. Because I love you. Well, you didn't have to. You're such a good homemaker and this and that. You do so good. And you don't have to do all that. Why did you do that? Yeah, I just love you. And she'll make a little special treat or my favorite dessert. I like that chocolate or vanilla eclairs, you know, the chocolate, thick chocolate, you know, melted. Uh, I like that stuff. And, uh, but she'll make homemade eclairs, and, and it's, then it's a big process to go through and do that. And I said, honey, you, what's the occasion? Is it, it's not my, I forget, my, our anniversary, did I forget? You know, what I forget? You know, I know if I'm in trouble. I'm sure I forgot something. And uh, she said, no, I just did it just because just I love you. Oh. And then in turn, I want to do things for her. Honey, why would you do that? Why would you buy that? Why would you come home with some flowers? Why would you come home with this? Because I love you. Because I love you. And boy, you talk about building a relationship in a marriage just because. Well, you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. But when you go the extra mile, all of a sudden it's like, wow, he really loves me. She really loves me. And when you go the extra mile with him, it's like, wow, he loves me. She loves me. And that's what we want God to never doubt our love for him. Are you a single mile Christian? You have to be to start off. You got to start off being a one mile Christian. And then when you come to mile marker, many drop the, the pack right there. And praise the Lord, you went one mile. That's wonderful. That is good. That's great. That's better than most. But God says, I want my children to keep on going. Because I know you're tired and sweaty and heavy and burdened and, and cramped and your back's cramped and your shoulder's sore, you're this, you're that, everything else. He says you're not going to be able to make it in your own strength, but you're going to make it in my strength. You're going to make it in my strength. And my strength is sufficient for thee. Father, I guess that's time's up. The buzzer went off. All right. Father, we thank, we thank.